Hi, Mark. Um, good to see you. Um, we are going to uh, show you today how you can establish a serial connection to our carrier control 1120 box and the smaller carrier operator. We show it uh, with the carrier control 1120, I believe. Uh, yep, I have one here that I prepared earlier. Okay, cool. Uh, basically, those boxes are the same. One is red, one is orange. By the way, Mark is uh, a member of our support team. Um, and from time to time, it is necessary for people, with, especially when they do want to do an RMA for um, a broken box, uh, that they give uh, additional information to Mark or one of his colleagues. Uh, and Mark is going to show you today how you can retrieve so such uh, information with a serial connection to the box because this 1120 does not have any VGA uh, output. It has only the serial output. Okay, the big ones um, have a VGA and the new NG100 has a HDMI output so you can directly see it on a monitor. But Mark is going to show you how you can do this uh, with the terminal uh, application, I believe, and the serial cable. So, Mark, okay. it's up to you. Ooh. Okay, so we have one of these. This is a normal RJ45 to 9-pin serial RS-232 cable. Mm -hmm. This plugs into this port here on the console port, as you can see, it's that one there. Yeah. Let me plug that in now. And then what you do is you plug your the 9-pin connector into the back of your PC into the 9-pin serial port that's on the back there. Mm -hmm. Now, I hate to say, with Macs, it's a little bit different. Because there are no legacy ports there now, you will have to try using a USB to serial adapter and then try and find some sort of terminal emulator software for that. This is why I always tend to do my tests on a PC, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. there's software available and they have legacy ports so okay. it's always handy to keep an old pc around because it doesn't need to be anything special yeah uh, by the way is the cable uh, included in those boxes i believe that every small control and small operator box does come with a okay. console cable okay perfect so um we have now plugged it in and you have con already connected it to your pc so i think you can now show some uh, how you do it with your PC? Um, sure. I'm I just... tend to use a piece of software called Realterm. Um, ah, okay. Since Microsoft stopped providing you with Hyperterminal, which uh -huh. is what I used to do back in the day, um, I've had to find an alternative. Realterm's free, and it, it works just pretty well, actually. So let's have a look at what this looks like. Okay. So I will hide uh, the video pod and make the the screen share a little bit bigger so people have can see more of your screen. Ah, so this is a real term uh, software. Is it free of charge? It is totally free. Uh, you can download it off the internet. Okay. And once it's installed, there's a few bits of configuration that you need to do to get it talking to your operator or control box mm -hmm. through serial. Mm -hmm. So first things first, you'll get this display. What you need to do is change the display mode from ASCII, which is the default, to ANSI. Mm -hmm. This will use the ANSI character set, which means you'll get color display and proper character display. Mm -hmm. If you don't use that, you'll get a mixed match of characters and it's very hard to read. I always tend to set here the rows to 24 and columns 80, which is a standard 80 by 24 no, console no, no, display. Mm -hmm. Next up, we go to port. We have to tell the serial port to be able to talk to the box. By default, it uses 9600 board, no parity, and eight data bits. Stop bits left at one, and you can leave the hardware flow control to none as well. Once that's selected, click change, and we're ready to go. So, let's turn on the box and find out what happens. Box is now on. You should see up here, and there we go. Ah, this is already coming from the box. This is already coming through the box, through the serial cable. Ah, okay. And as you can see, it looks just like a standard PC boot screen because basically they are just short, small PCs. Uh-huh. 
By the way, the noise you hear in the background is our the rest of the uh, support uh, colleagues. So um, we are basically consuming your time during a normal working day, and uh, we appreciate that pretty much. That's okay. We're here to help. So now you can see we've got a login screen. I will yeah. have to say that the display isn't perfect because it's not a monitor. It doesn't refresh what was put on there beforehand. So there is a handy clear button. You can click on that. And if I do that, I now get the proper shell access. Ah. You can now log in. You can now log in as root and the admin password if it's got one. Yeah. But you need to remember what your admin password is. I hope it's this. Right. <laughs> Could it be that it is when you have not changed something it's a basically. standard carryo so yeah. basically you can log in at the back end at this point now what i'm going to do i think what we're going to do now yeah. is i think what we need to do is now need to show you guys how to flash a box if okay that, if you want to do that so you can actually see what happens so i'm going to plug my usb stick with a recovery yeah. image recorded to it okay. now a lot of people have problems with usb sticks i've found yeah. commonly when people try to do a diagnostic yeah. or try to factory reset their um, control boxes or operator boxes back that it will fall over normally it will not boot mm -hmm. that's down to the usb stick itself I found that the boxes tend to be a bit picky when it comes to USB sticks. Mm -hmm. So we stick to, I mean, I use a uh, Flash Voyager for okay. mine. I find that it works every time. It's just great. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to reboot this box and show you what happens when you've got a USB stick plugged into it. Mm -hmm. Once this thing turns off. By the way, the uh, USB diagnostics uh, before we um, RMA a box should be done anyway. Yes. That diagnostic uh, USB basically goes through, tests the hard drive to see if there's any bad blocks, mm -hmm. checks the, uh, the system as well, checks the CPU, and it does a full memory scan as well. Mm -hmm. So it checks for any bad blocks in the memory. Which is what we use then to check to see if there's a physical fault with the box. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to clear my screen and I'm now going to fire up this box so you can see what happens when you've got a USB stick plugged into it. And I should mention, Carson, Carson, that this might not be, as you can see, here we go, it's already detected my USB drive. Mm -hmm. It's found the Corsair Voyager. Mm -hmm. So in theory, if this machine has the correct uh, BIOS settings, mm -hmm. it will boot from the USB drive first and then boot from the, uh, the mass storage device built into it. Mm -hmm. Now, I should mention that some early small boxes didn't have this set in the BIOS. This is why the console cable is very useful. You can actually boot up, go into the BIOS if you put a USB keyboard into it, yeah. and change the BIOS so it boots from USB. Ah. So, so basically, all, all those boxes are, yeah, let's say, small PCs, uh, and you can use yes. the second USB. Um, I think the, the also the small one has two USB, or even if it has only one, you can uh, use it uh, use a normal USB keyboard uh, to enter the boot device settings of the BIOS. Exactly. Oh, yeah, that's cool. That's correct. And it's the same for the larger boxes as well. Um, it's easier with the large control because they've got a VGA port. You just put a keyboard into there, and put in a VGA monitor, and you just boot it up like a PC. Mm -hmm. It's also very handy if you want to get root level access to it. You can then check to see if the box is responding, room top, run all your usual sort of Linux diagnostic commands, You know, even if you want to do an FSCK. To yeah. check that the disk's correct, you uh -huh. can do that as well through, through the console. I don't know if you, it's going to push into so, talking the about the USB mass storage or the USB sticks, I think uh, sticks you can buy some sticks which have a fixed partition, uh, a fixed first partition, where you sometimes have some, I don't know, mobile applications from the vendor and yeah. stuff like that. I think those sticks will definitely fail. 
when you try to use it? They would need to be completely wiped. Okay. Yeah, so you, you yeah, probably no, have to follow the uh, knowledge base article on uh, yeah. the diagnostics one procedure one one because some like USB like sticks that. will need to be formatted with an MBR or a master boot record mm -hmm. to be able to run off one of these smaller boxes. Mm -hmm. um, and also, it came, yeah, sometimes uh, I came across with sticks, uh, even when you wipe them completely, they have some fixed hidden partition which can't be wiped. Uh, so uh, I experienced this uh, when I uh, tried to create a boot stick for my OS X machine. Um, I think those sticks will also be cause some complication. I believe. Sure. Okay. Yeah. That's why you have to be. I've always found that a bare bones, you know, four gigabyte stick will do the job. It's oh. never going to use all that space, but it's, it just seems to work. I mean, that's the size of my drive here. But then again, I've got a 16 gig stick here that works fine as well. So, mm -hmm. you know, to each their own. It's USB sticks are never the same. So you may have to try a couple or maybe even more no. before you find the one that will work correctly. <laughs> okay. Okay. Now, currently, as you know, the boot procedure for one of these, when you've got a USB stick in, especially if it's doing a factory reset, can take up to, you know, up to 30 minutes or so. 30. But it will normally tell you, like, okay. 30, 30, yeah, it depends on the, the system okay. and which box it is. And this is quite happily flashing away, because I can see the activity light on the USB stick flashing away. Okay. So let's wait for this to do its rebooting because no. I think it's getting to that point. No, and then so we should get some console data to do that. I've just done a beep. Yeah. Which means it's, it's, it's and another beep. Yep. And another beep. Probably, yeah, probably. So, but and now it's accessing it the USB like stick again. Um, not okay. all so it's not too access is shown through the console, I hate to say. It depends on well, what stage it's at in the BIOS reboot. Mm -hmm. But I tell you, the console method has got me out of some sticky situations where some people have turned around and said, oh, the box needs to be replaced. It's not working. Mm -hmm. You go in there, check that the boot order is correct. And if it's not correct, you can change the boot order. It'll boot from the USB and oof, it's been reformatted. Okay. And it's still working. <clears throat> But just just to make it clear, when you're doing a factory reset via USB, uh, the control box is completely wiped. So if you do not have any um, configuration settings saved before, yep. you start from scratch. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. I do believe this is now just getting very close to finishing now. I should hear it, which is the standard noise. Eventually, because it has just rebooted, uh -huh. so it's now doing its final bits and bobs on the mass storage. Yeah. By the way, it's interesting. You in real time, you can also monitor: um, is it connected now? Does it get any data? Because I just saw that there are some status lights on the right-hand side. Uh, yeah, and you they see were green, and now they on. just yeah. turned off. Yeah, that means there's no data coming through at the moment because we get to see. Uh, there we go. Bit of it. I'm just um, to lip. And and immediately go. we see. Yeah. Uh, you can see data lights there. Yeah. I'll clear that. Do that, and there we go. We've got our control login again. So in theory, I should. Yeah, to log in. There we go. As you can see, I've got full access to the shell. It's a little bit slow, but there it is. Now I've got access to it. I can run top. This is slow, <laughs> but yeah. you can see that WinRoot's running, processors are running, yeah. see how much CPU is being used, which is really handy. And I remember, <clears throat> cool. So I remember from uh, talking with one uh, of our preferred or uh, yeah, with let's say with Brainworks, 
Um, I talked to Sebastian. Sometimes uh, you would like to have some logs copied over or a look into the logs um, where also this uh, serial connection would be necessary. So what exactly we need to do to make you uh, support people happy? Well, if you can access the console and you can access the system like this, you can change into opt carrier win route logs. Yes. And here are the logs. So in here, what I can do is I can, let's just clear the display and do it. So let's do a, a tail on the config.log. There we go. That was the only entry in there, it's inserting certificates. Because it's basically there. a blank. Uh, blank co uh, control at the moment, so um, there's nothing to show. And as you can see, I've looked in the warning log, there's no valid license, so this hasn't been set up, which is what you'd expect to see. But on a box that you're trying to diagnose, you can use tail to see the last um, few lines of a log. Ah, so this is also, uh, and this is basically pretty handy when you cannot go to the administration interface anymore of the control box, exactly. it's not responding. You should try to use a serial connection and maybe it's possible at least to uh, lock into the uh, control exactly. box via serial and to see some if there is something in the locks. And this is basically the thing uh, you, needed, you need to know before you are, let's say, allowed to initiate the process of an RMA. Yeah, you need to be able to confirm that the box is actually broken. Okay. Like I say, normally putting the diagnostic information against it will give us a, a, a good overview of the data to this. We can check the physical box if it's overheating because we get um, CPU information, so it could be that it's running hot, uh -huh. which can happen. Um, but if you want, if you think oh, I can't access the web admin, maybe the website of it's logged, you know, locked up or something like that, use the console cable, log in, and you can physically check the logs. You can run top as well to check to see whether or not the CPU is being hammered. Uh -huh. um, so you know it's, it's it's very handy. Okay. So if you would like, if if you would like to see uh, the yeah the entries of a specific log. Is it possible to copy and paste it here from the real term to send it over to you via our support ticket system? In theory, you can do that. You can do a control C and then if I run notepad, we should be able to do that. So again, if people, if you need some, yeah, some insight of the locks and you cannot access the um, the operator box or the control box uh, via the normal web administration interface plug in this the serial cable start your real term or terminal program uh, on your pc and then you should be at least uh, it should be at least possible to log into the box and uh, yeah give you as the support people the appropriate information you need uh, so you can maybe initiate some RMA process. Exactly. Cool. And you also need to be able to, I mean, you also have to check physical issues as well, especially with the small boxes, check to see whether or not it's the, you know, the, the power cables not sitting correctly. Maybe it's getting too hot. Maybe you've got it in a place that's not got adequate cooling because mm -hmm. basically the whole box is a heat sink. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. So the whole case it needs to be cool. Okay. But if it gets overly hot, then of course you can have problems like you would with any normal PC. Yeah, okay. So as the whole whole box uh, of the 1120 is a heatsink, don't abuse it as a, I don't know, coffee cup warmer or something. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay. Yeah, thank you, Mark, so much for showing us how to serial into... Um, one, uh, in one of our boxes. Uh, much appreciated uh, that you spent some time to show it to our customers. Yep. Okay. We'll keep an eye on those. We're here to help.